monitor coupon? Oh, hold on, I gotta, I gotta mute everybody. Um, but while I mute everybody, good morning, everybody who's joining us uh, online or uh, after the fact or non-live or uh, anything like that. Uh, welcome to Bible study. We're in uh, week 17 of the Gospel of Luke, um, and we will be covering chapter 15 today. Um, so once you have all your study guides from uh, our, our website, st-matthew.org, you can download them there, print them at home. Um, you can pause it if you need to print them now if you're watching after the fact, uh, but I'll go ahead and read our introduction now. Uh, so it's been it's been quite some time since we've met because all of the holidays that have come up and, and this and that. So I haven't seen you uh, for for quite some time, but um, I'll read the introduction and uh, say a few words, and then we'll dive into the scripture. In our last session, Jesus conversation at the banquet table reinforced his teachings on status in the kingdom, the coming judgment and the cost of being a disciple. The next chapter of Luke takes place at that very same table, and Jesus is about to tell three parables, which are uh, metaphorical stories that reveal a truth about God or life or people, and these parables essentially say the same thing, but with a different focus each time. And as we read them, the heart of God for the lost and the outcast is revealed to those who have rejected them for a long time time okay so it's important that we know where we're coming from because this is still the same section of narrative just broken up into two chapters so we had the the people who were sitting remember higher at the table um than they should have been and jesus said listen you don't want to get caught by the master of the feast by the host to say hey you you're not that important. Move down a couple of seats, right? So he's speaking to the Pharisees. Don't make yourself more important than other people, um, because in the kingdom of God, you will be demoted, and it'll be to your shame and all those things. Um, but those who are last, those who are lowest, are the ones who will be exalted in the kingdom. Uh, then Jesus reinforced that the judgment is coming, right? Uh, the son will return to judge the living and the dead. Um, and his disciples, his true disciples, better be ready, not just following along, not just saying, well, that Jesus is great, but uh, really, truly being prepared, being ready, acting out the will of God, because if he comes back and he catches them sleeping, uh, there's going to be punishment, all right? So that's where we're just coming from right now. And um, we'll go ahead and read our first section for today, which is uh, Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. Okay, so as we go into these parables, one thing I'd like to mention uh, is with much of our Bible study, we have a limited time to cover a certain piece of scripture. So in the parables that we're going to see today, there is so much to unpack. It's so rich with meaning um, and, and with literature and language, all of these different things. We can't do it all. So we're just going to focus on a few aspects of it. Uh, and the first thing that I'd like for us to, to know is to answer question number one, right? What is the driving force? Uh, the impetus for Jesus telling of the three parables of this chapter. And so if we go to our scripture and we look at verse two, right, it all starts. Uh, this is all a response to the Pharisees who are muttering, right? This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They're scoffing at Jesus. Um, and remember after his, um, his teaching in the last chapter, right, uh, the low will be made uh, high and the high will be made low. Um, now, all of a sudden, you have 
a, a crowd of people who usually wouldn't dare to be around Jesus, kind of starting to, to sit around him and enjoy his company a little more as he embraces them as well. Uh, there is uh, an old rabbinic saying in ancient Judaism that says, uh, let not a man associate with the wicked, not even to bring him into the law. And so there was a, a culture among those who were uh, religiously righteous that, you know what, it's just not worth dealing with those sinful people. Don't even associate with them. Um, don't even try to bring them back into the law. Just let it be. Um, and so tax collectors, um, if, if you know, um, were almost universally hated by people. Um, they were people who worked for the Romans, who were currently, um, um, the, the, Israel was one of the territories of the Roman Empire at the time. Um, and since it was, you know, God's given land to his chosen people, uh, that didn't sit well at all with them. And so those who would collect taxes would work on behalf of the Romans um, to take their money and give it on to the empire. But what would happen a lot, too, uh, as you may know, is that the tax collector would, uh, you know, skim a little off the top, charge a little extra and fleece everybody. And in these territories, um, they were also uh, Jewish people. So they were kind of seen as traitors, right? And then sinners were just those who lived outside of God's law in any way. Um, I don't have too many specifics as far as that goes, um, but those who just didn't conduct themselves in an upright manner according to either God's law or the, the law of the Pharisees that had been piled on and piled on, okay? Uh, so they were uh, outcasts, both tax collectors and sinners. It's a little bit of a broad, right? anybody who's like evil or awful. Um, and they were outcast then by the, the righteous religious Pharisees, all right? Um, one thing that I'd like to note, though, is that in Luke chapter 5, Jesus makes very, very clear um, what his mission is uh, throughout his ministry. And he says, uh, it says, Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, okay? Um, so this is 10 chapters ago. Jesus sets out with this mindset. He has shared this with people already, but the Pharisees just cannot seem to get over um, their limited understanding of how the world works, all right? So essentially, what gets Jesus started on uh, this three-parable story rant while well, it's the Pharisees muttering about who he sits with. All right. Um, so question two is this, when you think about it, uh, shouldn't God be happier over the righteous? Um, how do you think the Pharisees feel about the statement in verse seven? And again, uh, seven says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons uh, who don't need to repent. All right. Uh, hello, Laverne and Karen. I see that you just joined us. Um, we are on question two of the study guide. Um, so shouldn't God be happier over the righteous, right? The, uh, the, the 99 who are doing what they're supposed to. Um, and so Jesus, we need to remember um, he's not just telling stories for the sake of stories. He is sitting with Pharisees and with sinners and telling this story to them. We're not the primary recipients of this story. Um, so what's good news in this story for some people, right? The lost ones kind of sounds like bad news to those um, who are righteous, either that they're getting cheated or, you know, why, why aren't I more special to God um, than somebody who, you know, all those kinds of things. So you would kind of think that maybe those who are righteous, they should get better treatment. Um, no, remember, uh, in the scripture, it, it's not a distinction between no rejoicing and any rejoicing, right? God delights in the righteous, and there is rejoicing in the righteousness of God's people when they follow his will and they carry out the mission, of course, but there's simply more rejoicing when a sinner repents. And in order for us to understand it, um, we need to understand, again, what the goal and the mission and um, the, the purpose of the ministry of Jesus is and what God wants 
with this world and its people. According to the Pharisees, it's, you know, and this is very, very uh, broad, okay, but it's, it's, it's law-based, it's works-based. So um, you say God created the world, uh, the world, but humans fell into sin, and God gave us the law so that we would have a chance to prove to God that we are righteous and, and we are worthy, and then maybe we'll have his favor, right? But um, God's goal is the wholeness and restoration of the world and the people of the world. And that's why he sent Jesus um, to be the shepherd who goes after the lost, right? Uh, God's biggest desire is that wholeness, to, to bring the sheep back, to have them back to himself. Um, and if, if that happens, if that goal is achieved to a greater measure and a new sheep comes in, of course, that's reason for great rejoicing because that's the goal. So knowing the Pharisees, though, they are probably raging inside when they hear the words of Jesus. Uh, because according to them, right, who is more righteous than us? What an insult. We follow all of the laws. We follow them so closely. We made extra laws and we then follow those laws. And God cares about the law. So it's, it's easy for the Pharisees uh, to kind of get blocked up in that. And I think even now for us, um, it can be difficult to hear that somehow, right? You know, let, let's say you're a, a kid and, um, you know, you do everything right, but your, your sibling does something wrong. And well, we'll get into that a little later in the scripture, but let's say that you're, you know, at work and you always do your work and you hand it in on time and you meet every deadline. And, uh, it, well, that's just, you know, that's just, uh, you know, John Doe, that's just Jane Doe always doing their work. And then you've got, uh, you know, Slacker McSlackerson who finally gets a project in on time and everybody goes, oh, McSlackerson, you did it. Awesome. And the whole office cheers. You would be pretty angry about that, right? So, you know, the Pharisees are, are not too happy. So, um, but when we relate that to maybe a church scenario even, right? Uh, how do you think members of a church would react if the pastor said, you know what? We're going to spend all of our time, all of our energy, all of our resources just talking to sinners, just talking to unchurched people. You know, we'll do the services, we'll do like the bare minimum, but we're not going to spend a lot of time with the members. We're not going to do any of this and that. People would get understandably angry, right? Um, and that's not to say that we're going to abandon the people of the church or that caring for members isn't important. Um, but I think if, you know, we said, all right, 80% of St. Matthew's budget is going to go to, you know, hanging out with people at the mosque, um, someone's going to be mad. There'd probably be a well-attended congregational meeting, um, not because we're all evil and we don't like uh, God's mission, but because we just have a, a sinful disposition uh, about some things. So that's, um, that's all I've got for the first section so far. Let me see if I have any notes on um, um, you know, I, let me open it up to a question. Does anybody have a question so far in this first section of parable? Yeah, Kathy, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Kathy. Okay, there, there we go. I, I don't have a question, but I just thought about the, the Pharisees. Do you think maybe they were just jealous too? Um, you uh, know, and that, of course, is a sin that, you know, people don't many times recognize that jealousy um, of other people or other situations yes. um, can be a problem. I, I think there is a, a jealousy here. And, you know, I wrote in, in my notes here, um, that the this is very exciting news for newly repentant people, but it's kind of lame for the righteous. And the reason I was thinking about it is that um, I mention this quite often in my sermons, but uh, we tend to view the story of God and of the Bible and of the world uh, with us at the center of it, right? Um, and so we want to be pursued by God. We want to be chased. We want to be the object of God's desire. Um, but it's kind of the other way around, right? The story has God at the center. Um, and when the mission is God's mission, if we are already in the flock, um, then rather than us being jealous at the rejoicing uh, for others, 
we are part of the rejoicing, right? When God rejoices, we rejoice. So I, I think there, there is a jealousy to it. And I think, um, I think we can very easily fall into it uh, as well as the, the Pharisees. That's a great point, Kathy. Good question. Uh, okay, let's go on to um, our next section, which is Luke 15, 8 through 10, right? Just a short little secondary parable. Um, Kathy, while I read, if you can somehow find a way to lower your hand, or maybe I can do it for you. Ah, I did it. Don't worry about it, Kathy. Okay. Uh, Luke uh, 15, 8 through 10 reads this. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. All right. Now, uh, question number three is this. What does the imagery of the coins tell us about the value of those who are lost? Um, I think I may have been able to phrase it a little better now that I'm uh, reading it, but essentially here's, here's the point that I would uh, like to make. Um, even though the coin is lost, it does not lose its value. It is still a coin of the same denomination of the other coins, right? Um, so note that the coin becomes lost not worthless. And in the same way, the sinner who repents is still a sheep in the last parable as well, okay? So just because somebody is lost or a sinner it doesn't diminish their value in God's eyes, okay? Still very, very precious, right? Uh, that's one little note. So now we'll go into a uh, question number four, which is a breakout. So I'll let you chit chat for just a couple of minutes after I read it. Uh, and as I do, I just want to set out the breakout rooms and um, remind everybody who's watching afterward online. Uh, as soon as um, I go into the breakout rooms, I'll pause the recording. You can pause it as well. Um, and then when you're done with your own reflection by yourself or with your family, anything like that, you can just go ahead and continue the video and we'll go through the answer. So I'm creating the rooms and uh, I'm going to open it up. Actually, I didn't read the question, did I? Um, did I? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Did read, didn't read? No, okay, I'll read it then. All right, I always do forget. When the coin is lost, the woman lights a lamp, sweeps the house, and searches carefully for it. Similarly, the shepherd goes out to search for the sheep and carries it back to the fold. What parallels can we draw between the conduct of these two and the conduct of God. All right, I'm opening up all the rooms, so go ahead and accept the invitation, and uh, just remember, let the timer run out to bring us all back, okay? All right, welcome back, everybody. So, uh, essentially, I hope you had some good discussion, but both of these examples um, show that the subject of the story, whether it's the shepherd or the woman, is very active in pursuit of the lost one, right? The woman doesn't wait around doing nothing, thinking, you know what, maybe it'll just show up one day. And neither does the shepherd say, well, if that sheep wants back in, it should decide for itself and make up its mind and hustle on back to me, right? Uh, instead, uh, we've got the sweeping, we've got the lighting a lamp, we've got the going out and searching and the carrying, right? The parallel that we can draw is that God, since the moment we fell into sin um, in the Garden of Eden, has been active in bringing us back to himself. We see that all throughout the Old Testament, uh, we see it in the New Testament, and we see it uh, where God even goes to the point um, of coming to earth pursuing us by being made in the flesh uh, to die for us. And so um, because of him, because of his pursuit, um, because of us choosing us, of giving us faith, of drawing us to himself, of doing the work of salvation that's necessary, um, he achieves the goal, uh, which is the same goal as the woman and the shepherd in the parable, to restore to himself 
um, the, the fullness of, of his creation. Um, that's what God desires. He wants to be with us in full, restored relationship again. Um, and he doesn't stop at anything uh, to do that for us, all right? Um, did you all have any, um, any cool input, any questions, uh, any observations from the group that you'd like to share? Okay. All right. Well, let's go on to we, our, oh, go we ahead. Like to comment. We like to comment about whether it's lost or not, doesn't, do, the value doesn't diminish. Okay. You know, on that, we felt was the same with both situations. But I also thought about the coin. If you're spending too much time looking for it and you don't just let it, uh, let the Lord try it, help you find it, <laughs> sometimes you need to do that too. No. Yes, and it it, de it depends on um, how we interpret the parable, right? Um, the The base assumption would be that um, God is the main character in the scripture. Uh, so if we become the woman, um, yeah, yeah, there, you know, um, we we shouldn't freak out too much about our coins. I think that's a good a good guide in life. Um, but well, one thing that I sh oh, go ahead, Kathy. Well, and sometimes it takes more time for things to occur. You know, we, mm -hmm. with our our Japanese ministry, we you know they, it takes they say twenty years for them to come to Christ. Okay, right. And so we need to go on and not neglect them, but to, uh, to um, continue to encourage them, mm -hmm. as well as find others. You know. Yeah. Um, one thing okay. I. Yeah, thank you. One thing I should have mentioned, um, that's a, an important reminder when we talk about parables. Um, not every parable has a perfect, this is this, this is that, everything wraps up very neatly. Um, because parables are not perfect allegories. They are parables. Not everything is supposed to represent something perfectly. And the reason that we have three different stories um, not everything equates to everybody perfectly, even among these three stories, right? And so um, some of the focus will be on, you know, uh, in, in the, well, I'll talk about that a, a little bit at the end, because I don't want to uh, give too much uh, away. But these are, these are good observations. But let's have our base assumption be that God is the one doing, he's the main character uh, in, in these parables. But um, okay. Good discussion, though. I like that you're all thinking about it. But hey, here, comes the, here comes the big... Oh, go ahead. Who's uh, Bill? Bill. Yes. Can I just make one quick comment? Uh, I thought I thought an interesting... I know you said not every parable has you know the same meaning and the same interpretation, but in my Bible, it talks about Palestinian women. When they got married, they received 10 coins as a component of their wedding gift, okay? So not only did this have monetary value for this woman, but it also had a sentimental value, almost a spiritual value or a relationship value. And if you think about God, you could, you could draw that correlation to God as well, not just the monetary component, but the fact that he has a relationship with that he loves us. I, that's all I wanted to say. Hey, that's really good, Bill. Uh, yeah, and some, some things that we wouldn't necessarily get from reading it in the context, um, but that the original hearer of the, the parable would know is that uh, this is most likely not a wealthy woman. It's a peasant woman, right? Uh, there are no windows in her home, uh, which is why she needs to light a lamp to go look for stuff, okay? Um, and this is uh, likely, these 10 coins are her the family savings that were passed on to her. Uh, and, and that's not a lot. Uh, it's about 10 days worth of wages, but it's all that she has. Um, so even when one coin goes missing, it's a tremendous loss. Um, so yeah, Bill, good observations. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, that's really, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, another one would be, yeah, yeah. Nope, that's all I got for that section. Um, all right, finally, the third parable. And this is the big kahuna of uh, today's scripture readings, right? Um, Jesus essentially, and 
I don't think it's uh, irreverent to phrase it this way, but the Pharisees uh, go, oh, look at who Jesus is sitting with. And Jesus spends three stories essentially asking, what is your problem, man? Um, and he does it in such detail that he says it three times just in case they didn't quite get it yet. Um, and so now we have what's known as the parable of the prodigal son, or the parable of the, the lost son. And uh, we've got a whole lot of uh, detail in this scripture. So I'm going to read the scripture, but I'm going to pause at certain moments to add in a little bit of detail, add in a little bit of background. So I don't mean to make it choppy, um, but just bear with me um, as we explore the scripture together. I'll go ahead and, and start us off on the reading. Jesus continue, uh, verse 11, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together, all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered all of his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So when so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Now, this is an important detail. Remember, everybody in this scripture, right, at the table, at this meal, is probably Jewish, right? Everybody in this story, in this family, is probably Jewish, okay? Uh, now, I don't know if you're familiar with kosher law today or uh, the kosher law of the Old Testament, but one thing that you do not eat when you are Jewish is pigs, Pigs are a uh, filthy, unclean animal, and you are not even supposed to be around pigs. But the, the young brother was so desperate that he took a job uh, for a citizen of that country, right? Um, a faraway country, a Gentile, non-Jewish country. So he submitted himself to work for a foreigner and on top of that to feed the pigs and be around them all day, okay? Okay. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs uh, were eating, and no one gave him anything. Little fun fact here, uh, the pods referenced in, um, uh, in this are most likely carob pods. And a carob is a, a tree, shrub, bush that grows in the Middle East um, that you know grows these pods. They kind of look like pea shoots, um, but they're like a dark brown black, and there's a kind of legume inside. Um, so that's just a little, if you Google carob pods, you go, huh, that's what that is. Um, so he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, the fattened calf, it's the big old meaty, right? Give it extra food to eat so that when we slaughter it, we can feed more people. This is the, the part, like, you know, the 10 foot party sub equivalent to a calf, right? We're having a big party, kill the fattened calf, tell everybody to come. It's a huge celebration. All right. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. 
So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years, I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed a fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. All right, we're going to go into our second break out of um, the day. And uh, we'll have a couple of minutes, I'll bring you back on the timer. Um, but we want to spend just a, a little time. Uh, and this is gonna be just, just two minutes, right? Uh, question number five, one helpful thing to practice when it comes to parables is to draw parallels between the story and between real life. Now, whom do you think the characters in this parable represent in real life. Um, so just go ahead. Um, I'll let you all discuss with each other for just two minutes, and then we'll come on back. Welcome back again, everybody. Uh, so as mentioned before, um, we're just not going to find absolutely perfect parallels in here, right? So th the man who has the two sons in this is God, okay? Now, one, one question that might pop up is that, well, so there's the man, but God still exists in the story, right? Um, I have sinned before against you and against God, the son says. So, well, which, which one's God in the story, the father or God? You can't read too much into it, right? It's not supposed to be a perfect one for one. You understand the point, even if they don't all match up, right? Um, the runaway son in this, uh, and, and I don't know what uh, comparisons y'all drew um, or who you thought this may be in real life, but as I mentioned before, and maybe this will be a little, little bit of a gotcha, but this story is being told in the real life context of Jesus sitting with the Pharisees and the tax collectors. So the runaway sons would be the tax collectors and the sinners who repent right? Those who are sitting around Jesus, those who are, yeah, learning all those kinds of things. And then the brother who stayed it would be the Pharisees then as well. Now, you know, could we go into, good job, Trinities, I can see you celebrating. Um, now, could we go into more detail of, well, who are the hired servants then? And who's the, the, the Gentile that hired him to feed the pigs? And who are the pigs? But the, these are not the fundamentally important characters to the story. And if we look too far into it, we might be able to find something interesting, um, but we may get so into the nitty gritty that we start missing the point of the story because we're trying to break it down just a little too much, right? Um, so a, a few notes um, as, we, as we get started on this, um, or... I should have mentioned this before we, uh, no, actually, this is the, the proper time. Uh, just in context of the story, the younger son is usually not the primary inheritor of an estate, right? And so for the younger brother to come up and say, ha ha, uh, I'm ready for the inheritance it is not normal. And second, um, asking for your inheritance then uh, while your father is still alive is very similar to doing it now, right? In our, in our modern day, you just don't do it. And essentially uh, it's saying, dad, why don't we cut to the chase? I need, or I want the money from my portion of the inheritance. So why don't you just give it to me? I don't have to wait for you to die because essentially you are better to me dead than you are alive at this moment. So just divide it up. Let me have my share now, and I can leave without waiting for you to die. All right. Uh, Stoltzes, what do you have for me? I talk about the different roles. I was in another Bible study where it's emphasizing the importance of father, fathers raising their children and, and just kind of blaming the dad for everything that goes wrong with the kids. Mm. And uh, I told this parable about the, the kid who thought he did everything his father wanted, then refused to go into the party. He didn't, he didn't, he chose not to go into heaven. 
And so John, don't study, ruin the rest of the Bible study. <laughs> Anyways, uh, they, they misinterpreted that saying, well, the father obviously was not treating the kids right. Otherwise, you wouldn't run away. Said, no, the father is God. He didn't make any mistakes here. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, that's a, that's interesting, right? I, I don't think family dynamics were quite the same back then as they are right now. It's like, oh, you know, the guy's messed up. He must have had some childhood trauma or anything like that, that we don't want to get that deep into the story either, right? And back then, we know that the father is has the honorable seat as the head of the household. What he says goes. He's the master of the estate. Uh, you know, it is it is part of God's covenant law of the Ten Commandments with Israel that you honor your mother and father. There's just no question about who is wrong in this immediate context. Uh, so that that is a good point, John. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay. So that gets us to question number six. When the younger son returns, his words to his father differ from his planned apology. Compare his anticipated reception with his actual reception. What does that tell you about the way that God treats repentant sinners? Now, I should probably have given you a little time. This would have been an okay breakout one, but you would have solved it really quickly. So I'm going to tell it to you. So here's what he's thinking. He's feeding the pigs. He's hungry. He's miserable. And so he goes, ah, I know. Here's what I'm going to say to my father. I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Okay, let's keep that last portion in our memory. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he actually gets to his father and he says, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your sermon, uh, servant, uh, your son. And then ah, the father cuts him off. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf, kill it. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. Okay. The planned speech. Uh, gets cut off. The best that the son could have hoped for in his mind is to say, after all of this garbage, after all of the stupid things I said and did, the disrespect, the squandering of all of the good gifts that I've been given, the best chance that I would ever have, and he's, he's thinking realistically, right? The best chance I would ever have is to come back to my father, to crawl back to him, and to just be a servant in his house. I'm not even, I'm not a son anymore. I'm just a servant. Okay. At least I'll have enough food to eat. Okay. And really after all he did, he didn't deserve to be back in the family. He was no status, nothing like that. Just a hired servant. Okay. Um, but the father cuts him off before he can even make the proposal and instead restores to him full status as a son. He puts a ring on his finger, the robe, the finest robe, the sandals. These are all signs of honor and status. And servants don't wear nice robes. Servants don't have nice rings. Servants don't wear shoes. Those are for members of the family. And so this tells us that even though um, they don't deserve to be called God's children, repentant sinners are rejoiced over and they are fully restored as God's true children and in their status. And the question that we ask is then, is that fair? And it's a really simple answer. No, it is not fair at all. Fairness is getting what you deserve. Fairness is suffering the consequence of your punishments. God is not fair. He's just, but he's not fair. Okay. And so well, repentant sinners get something much, much better than they deserve. Okay. Um, but again, what's God's desire for this world and for the people of this world? It's restoration, it's reconciliation, and it's bringing those who are far from him back to himself because our God is a God of love. He cares, He wants us. Okay. Even if He himself has to pay the price for our sin and for our foolishness. It's important that we remember the father is still alive. The father gave away all the money. All of the money is gone. He, to be a father in this culture 
And to know that one of your sons disrespected you like that, that's going to hurt your status in the community, right? For that son to go back and then for the father to run down the street to embrace that son, that's not the best thing for your status either, right? Um, so the father pays in every single way the price for the sin of the son and just restores him without asking anything from the son, okay? Um, any, well, let me get through this section and then we'll do questions so we don't have any more spoilers from John Stoltz. Um, yeah, just for those of you who are watching, this is a safe environment and a great Bible study. John is in on the joke. <laughs> so uh, let's get to question number seven. In what ways is the older brother right and or wrong, right? There's got to be something to what the brother is saying, right? He's not crazy. And can you sense any irony in his confrontation with the father? Okay. So um, the brother makes some good points, right? I never disobeyed you. I did everything that you wanted me to. And, and here I am. And there's no party for me and my friends. There's not even a lesser party for my sake or with my friends or anything like that. And so I think... I wouldn't say that the brother is right, but Kathy, as you alluded to in, in the first couple of parables, there is a jealousy there, right? Um, the, the, the older brother is getting caught in the same trap of saying, gosh, what about me? Oh, what about me? So I wouldn't say that he's right, okay? But while it may not be obvious at first glance, um, both of the sons greatly disrespect their father in this story, okay? The first one abandons his father. He uh, uh, demands his portion of the inheritance, but the other older brother refuses to join the celebration, okay? Now, his refusal to enter his home is a refusal to share in the meal of the celebration, and that is a symbolic act of huge proportions in a culture where kinship boundaries are secured through the sharing of food, okay? Eating that meal together, that's family, that's fellowship, um, that's uh, honoring your father to attend a feast that he arranges, okay? Um, now notice too, that the older brother, as he is describing himself, he removes himself from the family relationships he has with everybody, right? Uh, he starts to describe himself not as I am the son who stuck around, but I did everything you want as a servant, okay? Then he refuses to address his brother as his brother, right? We know that the younger brother is part of the family. He's back in, but now the older brother says, this son of yours, not my brother, he's your son, okay? Uh, and you're not my father, I'm not your son, I'm your servant. And so the irony then um, is that the son is, is just removing himself from the family because he has such a hard time accepting that the younger brother would also be included in the family. Um, so he, he's essentially saying, well, if that guy's in, I'm out. Uh, and another interesting detail is that uh, what does the scripture tell us um, about the actions of the younger brother? How did he lose his money uh, and all those things? Well, uh, in wild living, okay? Now, we can guess what wild living is, but the narrator, right, Jesus essentially, is, um, I think, intentionally vague and gracious in the description of the sins of, of the younger son. But the brother, uh, what does he say? He has squandered your property with prostitutes, right? So he's getting a lot more graphic. He's calling out the sin. But another thing that's interesting about that is even after the son is welcomed back and forgiven um, and a son, he still holds the sin of the younger brother against him and refuses to engage in the family uh, on the basis of that, all right? Um, 
Oh, I got to scroll back to the original question. Just a moment, Kathy. I'll keep you in the back of my head. Um, so the father pleads then with the older brother, I need you to understand that this is worth celebrating, right? Think of, think of this. This never affected the older brother's inheritance, right? It was divided fairly, right? The older brother was always going to have the larger portion. Your inheritance never went away. Everything that is mine is yours when the time comes. And here's just the monumental phrasing of this piece of scripture, right? Your brother was dead and is now alive. And now we start to see um, that in this parable, we can, it impregnates looking back the other parables with meaning, right? Uh, the lost sheep is dead. The lost coin is dead. And the repentant, uh, the, the sinner was dead, but is now alive, lost and now found. Those are the same two things. So here's the question um, or, or the argument that the father is making. Your brother was dead. He's alive now. What is there to be angry about? As the head of the household, as the father of both of these sons, his goal is to have both of his sons with him and well and restored. So the older brother, what he really needs to do is rather than seeing himself as the center of the story, um, needs to align with the mission and the desires of the father and rejoice with the father, all right? So as we zoom out now, um, does this sound exactly like the Pharisees? Yeah, it does. They are so angry and so jealous uh, that they cast out those whom God has restored and made alive again. Those who repent, those who come to Jesus, the Pharisees still won't have them because they can't fathom the audacity of God accepting them and rejoicing them despite their sin, and then rejoicing more um, than over those who are, again, righteous, which the Pharisees think that they are. And even if they were, they would still be in the wrong. They would still be in sin. And we're noticing, um, we've come up to this point already, the more that Jesus goes on in his ministry, the more we can see the Pharisees removing themselves. First, they question, then they challenge, then they plot, okay? Um, the more that the Pharisees put themselves at the center and not God's mission, the more they remove themselves from salvation itself, which is, it's really sad when you think about it. Those guys wanna honor God. They wanna serve God. They wanna do it the right way, but they're just not listening to God actually, all right? Um, Kathy, I still have you in mind, okay? So they keep casting out those whom God has already restored and made alive, whether it comes to all of Jesus's healings um, or his driving out of demons or his, uh, you know, acceptance of sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes uh, and all of that. So what they're doing is um, their rejection of God's restored people and of God's sent son is a refusal to join in the celebration. Okay, and they are disrespecting God um, just as much as the younger son or those who are still in their sin, right? Or the, the repentant ones before they repented. Um, one, one note that I have uh, on this is that uh, this reminds me very much of uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. Uh, it's a work of fiction, it's not scripture, um, but there is an incident in which, you know, there's a Everybody's in hell, and there's a bus that takes you from hell into heaven, uh, right? It kind of like, what would you call it? Um, the front room of heaven, the stoop, the foyer, right? And just if you go towards the mountains, you're in. Just, just go. Just walk. But the characters of hell bump into problems, uh, and the problems are the people that they see are already in heaven, right? Um, and so you've got, you know, Bob and Bob goes up there and he's in heaven and he goes, was that Jimmy? Jimmy, the guy who murdered that person back on earth? Well, if Jimmy's here, if murderers get into this place, I don't want to be here. 
Um, and so he rejects salvation. And that's not to say that that's what actually happens. But the whole point of the book is that those who are in hell, even if they had a second chance to go up to heaven afterwards, they would still reject it, right? And so uh, that was a, a really cool parallel that I saw um, uh, between that and the book. So K Kathy, you've got a question. You're muted. I was just going to say that the definition of jealousy, of course, is selfishness. Hmm. Um, so, you know, the older brother, by not repenting of his selfishness, which is a sin, right. okay, doesn't make him any better than the than the other son. Yeah, yeah. Um, one one definition um, that helps me uh, is the distinction between uh, jealousy and envy, right? So we, God says that he is a jealous God. Um, and when you are jealous, you don't want someone else. Um, oh, shoot. I always get these mixed up. Uh, so for jealousy, you don't want somebody to have what's yours, right? Um, and when it comes to I've completely lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. I don't even remember the two of the original terms. Envy is when you want something that somebody else has. Jealousy is when somebody's going after something that's yours. That's absolutely God's right. People. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So God is jealous because he doesn't want other gods uh, to, to have his. And um, But the Pharisees, they don't want anybody else to have what they have, right? We have God's recognition. We have the status. We, want, we don't want other people to have that. It's just for Pharisees. And if you want it, you become a Pharisee. That's not how it works at all, right? But yes, Kathy, you're right. It's that it's that uh, jealousy, that selfishness, that yeah, this is mine. You can't have that. That really gets in the way uh, of not only um, God's mission, but also your own salvation. Uh, Trinities, go ahead. I get the mute off. Okay. Uh, one of the comparisons that I was looking at was that uh, this would be seen by the Pharisees of the meeting of Esau uh, with uh, Jacob, where Jacob was very fearful of his return, and instead he's greeted with love by Esau. Mm. Mm. That's very nice. Good job, Trinities. Um, yeah, it's been a while since I've read that narrative, so nothing, yeah, I can't speak to it fresh from memory, but I actually do love that whole section of scripture. Um, okay, uh, did you guys have anything else? You're still un, uh, you're still unmuted. So okay, okay. I just just didn't want to leave okay. you hanging there. Um, okay, so here's our um, our, our kind of concluding question, right? And this kind of bugs you when you're reading the scripture. Why does the story not tell us if the brother ended up joining the party? Um, did he go in? Did he not go in? We know that he had complaints we know that he have problems but after the dad pleads with the older brother the story's over so what will it be and the important thing for us to remember is that we are what's called in in literary terms a frame tale narrative okay a story and a story and a story and you can really go infinitely deep with stories and stories if you've ever seen the movie inception um, it's got like story within story within story, or um, a, a, the, probably the most famous frame tale narrative would be the Arabian Nights. Um, there's story and story and story. Um, and so this in itself is a frame tale narrative, right? We are reading the Gospel of Luke, which is a recorded story in which we are hearing Jesus tell another story. Uh, and of course, if we wanted to take it a frame further, maybe the younger son had a story, um, but it doesn't go uh, quite that deep. So we're in a frame tale narrative, a story within a story. And as this story that Jesus is telling ends, it's ambiguous because the real question isn't, is the son going to join the party? The real question is, will the Pharisees accept repentant sinners and the true mission of God. The choice is theirs to make right then or start, you know, at, at that moment where the story ends. And because it's a story and a story and a story, we finish chapter 15. 
And we could say, well, are you going to be like the older brother? Are you going to be like the Pharisees? Oh, what are you going to do? We are left with the same decision. Will we cast out them, those whom God wants to bring back to himself? Will we be proud over what we are and what we've accomplished and how righteous we can be? Or will we rejoice with God um, at his saving work and even be part of it, right? Um, that's the real question that we have to ask ourselves. And we can go into a, a, an infinite amount of examples, but we're actually kind of experiencing this in our sermon series in Jonah right now. Uh, and we'll explore that a little more. But if there is just a group of people that you don't like, or you don't care for, or in your heart, you, you really have to admit, if you're being honest, I don't even want them to be saved, right? Or I don't, they don't deserve it. I'd be totally okay in heaven without them. That's the older brother, right? Those are the Pharisees. That's not God. God loves his creation. God loves the people of this world so much that he sent his son to die and to be raised again, not for a special few, but for everybody, okay? And so whenever there is someone, especially the farthest one that you ever think would come and repent, when that happens, of course there's rejoicing. And rather than saying, why don't you rejoice over me? Our inheritance was never lost. What's God's is always ours. And it will come when Jesus comes back for us. But in the meantime, let's rejoice. Let's want what we have for other people. And let's not get in the way of God's saving work or in jeopardy of our own salvation as we disrespect God and his mission and close us off from it. Okay. Um, any more questions? I got to wrap up here. So uh, I will uh, lead us in the closing thought and then I'll, I'll pray for us. This chapter, as well as the last one, is about the way that we view ourselves and our status in God's kingdom. Last chapter was a humbling lesson to the Pharisees regarding themselves as more important than they really were. This chapter teaches them not to regard others as beneath them or outside of them, right? So here are the questions that the Pharisees and we now have to wrestle with at the end of the conversation. What makes us so different when God values and pursues us all the same? And what makes us so special when the inheritance of God is for all? And will we rejoice in the common gift of salvation or refuse to join in the celebration because we want it to be about us? As we align ourselves with the will and the purpose of God, the answer should be crystal clear, all right? Um, if the answer is not crystal clear, we have recorded this Bible study and you can be throughout the week, um, but I'm just joking. Um, so let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much um, that even though we are the sheep that wanders, the coin that's lost, um, the younger brother, you are absolutely fervent in your pursuit of your people. You still love us. You still care about us. You still want us. And rather than taking us back uh, with some half or low status or anything like that. You just welcome us as sons. Um, God, would you lead us today to repentance, not only over our sins that we know of, but the sins that maybe have snuck up on us, the sins of pride and jealousy and casting out, the sins of departing from your mission. God, would you cleanse our hearts? Would you make them pure? And would you align us with your will? Lord, so that we can celebrate with you, rejoice with you, um, and, and be part of that work of bringing brothers and sisters into the love of Christ. Um, but God, as we do that, would you soften our hearts and would you shape us to be more like you in every way? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining or for watching. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording now. Uh, I'm going to say a couple of goodbyes to you afterwards, but until next week, bye, everybody.